What is it about mathematics that many students find intractable? What is it about mathematics that people across many backgrounds find arcane? And more importantly, has math education in the United States been effective at teaching the discipline not only for students to apply well-known problem-solving methods or techniques, but also for them to develop confidence in their ability to uncover patterns in abstract constructions and the making of their meaning? Uh, in the threefold focus of this presentation, we're going to briefly discuss the state of math education in the U.S., consider the study of mathematical aesthetics, in which we'll ask what makes a mathematical construction beautiful, and propose a new theory of what I consider a common mathematical aesthetic, before looking at two examples of research and pedagogical developments, which I think successfully integrate mathematical aesthetics for both teacher and student. So let's begin. If you take a look at some headlines, you'll find that the state of K-12 through math education has, for years, failed to uphold a high standard and quality of learning for students across the country because, well, out of the 35 industrialized nations who are members of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the United States ranks 31st, and in addition, results from the Program for International Student Development, uh, or PISA, indicate that the standing of the United States among the 72 nations who participate in the program has fallen to the, the bottom half of that list. Worse still is that those results came out in 2015 and researchers have more recently found a strong native, negative correlation between performance on mathematics PISA assessments and levels of math anxiety. Uh, Joe Baylor of the Stanford Graduate School of Education attributes math anxiety to ineffective practices that include time tests, speed pressure, and procedural tests. Uh, some others have pointed out shortcomings that are pertinent to the aims of mathematics. Uh, Paul Lockhart, the author of the treatise uh, Mathematician's Lament, points out that too often students are forced to accept as given a very specific subset of formalisms, notations, algorithms, which are altogether disengaged from a larger aesthetic frame. Uh, corollaries and theorems are presented only after these mathematical definitions are imparted to the student, but Lockhart rightly states that these definitions, quote, come from aesthetic decisions about what you as an artist consider important. That is, they are problem generated, in his words. <clears throat> so virtually absent from mathematics education is the presentation of any historical philosophical or artistic context of mathematical thought. Uh, the strict progression of courses that a typical high school student will experience or rather endure is the sequence of algebra one, geometry, algebra two, pre-calculus, and calculus. Uh, and that's sort of what leads Cornell University professor Tara Holm to call the single file death march that leads towards calculus. Uh, and yet there are um, there remains to be a lack of any significant research agenda among mathematicians or education professionals that might be able to work toward implementing mathematical aesthetics and reach some consensus over how a, a common mathematical aesthetic might be perceived uh, or experienced and how to better relate that to student instruction. More so than any other subject, mathematics is regarded and taught as a discipline in which the primary objective of the student is to arrive at correct responses through a set of dogmatic procedures and stressing manners of instruction uh, and assessment. The trouble with math as it is taught in many classrooms is the lack of accommodation for student exploration and creative risk-taking. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, well, I would argue that it's necessary to go back to the basics and consider the nature of mathematics and its aesthetics. On the whole, mathematical aesthetics has garnered little attention and little seriousness of thought from researchers, and it would perhaps be useful to not only consider the major perspectives of the subject, but also to develop a new theory that's influenced by the majors and the, the shortcomings of these perspectives. So with that said, I'm proposing what I call the three domain theory of mathematical aesthetic. And somewhat implicit in this theory is that aesthetic value in mathematics can be resolved with relative ease into distinct criteria uh, for ascribing this aesthetic value. 
Um, I should admit that earlier versions of this theory had attempted to uh, strict identify strictly demarcated criteria of mathematical aesthetic, but that theory has now been shaped to account for the subjective uh, in addition to the objective nature of aesthetic experience. Um, one of the steps taken in that transformation was the recharacterization of what were previously considered uh, aesthetic criteria into aesthetic domains of mathematics. And what calling these things domain serves to do is emphasize that aesthetic pleasure is derived from the individual perception and internalization of these domains, which exists in degrees rather than an all or nothing basis. <clears throat> I further claim that these three domains have the most prominent aesthetic roles in mathematics as they have been experienced by practitioners of mathematics um, taking into consideration the math community as a whole and uh, how mathematics has been practiced throughout history. But really, what's the purpose of this new jargon? Well, the vocabulary used thus far to describe mathematical aesthetics has been used in other contexts often associated with different issues in the studies of either mathematics or aesthetics. Uh, and for me, those associations have led to some ambiguity over, over this issue uh, uh, of, of their intersection of mathematics and aesthetics. So not only do I hope to use this new terminology to steer clear of any ambiguity, well, not all ambiguity, but at least some of it, um, what I aim to do with that is to further resolve each domain into aspects that might help pin down the varieties of mathematical aesthetic experience. Uh, a main point of this theory is that a mathematical relationship may be called beautiful if and only if aesthetic pleasure can be derived from the practitioner's experience of exercising her imagination to express mathematical truth along these three domains. So at first glance, that seems like too rigid and too generalizing a thing to say. Um, but in explaining the three domains and their constituent aspects as I have formulated them, I expect that this new theory should serve to strike a balance uh, between the school of thought that considers mathematical beauty as something that is mostly or entirely objective and the school of thought which considers math's beauty as something uh, subjective or entirely subjective. So as we discuss the three domains, uh, do keep in mind that they are intended to refer to a mathematical beauty that is achieved through the active experience and active appreciation of demonstrating mathematical truth and not by some inherent property that's thought to be expressed by a mathematical experience, uh, relationship rather, uh, in isolation. Uh, any elucidation of mathematical ex aesthetic experience, even one that's thought to be common, should address the personal engagement of the practitioner with mathematics itself. Um, with that said, let's move on to the, the domain of revelation or revelatory potential is characterized into two aspects, which I consider parsimony and legibility. And the parsimony of a mathematical relationship is a self-determined measure of the strength of that relationship by its ability to connect two or more apparently distinct concepts in mathematics. Uh, that measure must involve considering the propositions, definitions, and assumptions on which the mathematical relationship depends. Uh, in the case of a uh, a discrete mathematical relationship, it might be more parsimonious if one could experience the connection uh, between more than two established concepts in mathematics, more than three, more than four, and so on. Uh, so this kind of parsimony is not a literal one. If for some reason um, you have a mathematical relationship that relates four concepts, uh, has to be represented by notation that takes up three pages of space, that's only out of necessity for communicating the relationship to other mathematicians. So in this respect, that relationship could still be considered more beautiful than one whose representation can be written down on a single page, but which only relates to distinct mathematical concepts. Parsimony in its more literal interpretation uh, might be considered in this domain uh, as an entirely different aspect, that of legibility. 
And legibility refers to the ease by which a mathematician can abstract a mathematical relationship uh, by its representation. So in math, that representation involves the use of formalism and notation to express uh, discrete mathematical objects. Uh, the aesthetic value that's gained by the experience of engaging with these objects is context dependent. So one formalism might be favored over the use of another for a particular mathematical problem or even for an entire branch of mathematics. So the legibility of a mathematical expression depends on the acceptance of this formalism with respect to the larger socio-cultural tradition from which a single problem or an overall branch of mathematics originates. Now onto the domain of aesthetics, which I call demonstrability. Uh, the aspects of versatility and extrapolability are subsumed under this domain. Uh, and versatility pertains to the, um, the multiplicity of arguments by which a mathematical relationship can be justified. So for example, the Pythagorean theorem is a relationship which can be proved in a remarkable diversity of ways. Uh, and with understanding each new proof um, and the diversity of approaches by which one could argue for the truth of the mathematical relationship, the truth of the Pythagorean theorem, a student augments her intuitive understanding of that relationship. And the refinement of that intuition, as we'll see later on, can be channeled in math pedagogy by collaboration and dialogue that allows students to exchange mathematical ideas and by extension, their aesthetic preferences with each other. Um, and finally, to pinpoint briefly what I mean by extrapolability, uh, that refers to the aesthetic value that's found by deriving any corollaries that follow from a mathematical relationship, as well as the novel intuitive understanding that emerges from generalizing a mathematical relationship. So to go back to the Pythagorean theorem, um, it can be shown that the fundamental pattern that exists between the areas of squares drawn along the sides of a right triangle can be extended to apply for any three similar shapes that are drawn along the sides of a right triangle. Um, and then there is perpetuity, which I resolve into two types that I call specific perpetuity and fundamental perpetuity. Uh, specific perpetuity inheres in the consistency and relatedness of a network of mathematical concepts as described by one or more mathematical objects and it's generally confined to one paradigm of mathematical thought. And that begs the question, are there many paradigms of mathematical thought? Absolutely. So each paradigm can be drawn in correspondence to uh, each different branch of mathematics or even each version uh, within a branch of mathematics. So for instance, there are several different versions of geometry with the main distinction being between geometry as Euclid put it, called Euclidean geometry, and those developed in a non-Euclidean tradition called non-Euclidean geometries. And uh, <clears throat> the core variable among these geometries and between any distinct versions of the branches of mathematics uh, is in their axioms. The axioms of a branch of math establish the inferential logic by which proofs can be constructed and serve to justify relationships that follow from these axioms. Um, in contrast, fundamental perpetuity concerns the nature of all mathematical thought. Um, I assert that this aspect of perpetuity yields aesthetic value um, insofar as the mathematician understands the truth of a mathematical relationship uh, in all cases where the essential constraints referenced by a single mathematical expression are held constant. And um, I, I elaborate on that a bit more in the paper. Um, so what we have now is a theory or a scheme, not by which we can judge authoritatively or ultimately that a mathematical relationship is beautiful, but one in which we can better understand the nature of mathematical aesthetic experience into what I consider the common mathematical aesthetic. So here I've meant to give some objective foundation toward the consideration of this aesthetic, but I've also tried to account for the understanding that the aspects of the three domains 
uh, as I have put them, exists in varying degrees uh, from individual to individual. What I call the common mathematical aesthetic is in essence typified by the popular aesthetic responses among mathematicians. So the three domain theory is also meant to be fluid and you know, by no means uniform across cultures, societies, or eras of human history, because the common mathematical aesthetic evolves in tandem with human history, and it's influenced uh, according to the practice or how mathematics is practiced uh, in different societies. Um, a full-blown discussion of that topic is probably better left for another presentation, but before finishing up, I'd like to quickly point out uh, a model example of aesthetically guided math pedagogy and what research um, might be relevant. So one model that I have in mind is the dis has been produced by the Discovering the Art of Mathematics project uh, from Westfield State University, which is now in its beta form. And uh, the project provides on its website a series of learning guides. Um, and each learning guide focuses on a content area such as number theory, geometry, uh, music, and dance. And one very fruitful body of research, which I found um, related to the project, uh, was in a longitudinal study conducted by Carolyn Maher of Rutgers University, in which a randomly selected group of students from New Jersey were followed for over 20 years to help generate uh, professional development studies in math education. Uh, to better understand how students learn mathematics. Uh, the implications of the Westfield State uh, Project and the Maher Longitudinal Study uh, for math education, I think, cannot be overstated. They demonstrate that a more liberal and effective pedagogy of mathematics can be reached if educators endeavor to implement an inquiry-based, communal, and respectful in the artistic sense, so an artistically respectful environment that would be conducive to the development of each student's unique mathematical aesthetic. <clears throat> and finally, uh, just a word on imaginative learning. Um, imaginative, imaginative learning is key to better mathematics education, and with the three domain theory in effective practice, Educators can work to cultivate environments in which a learner gains satisfaction from the pursuit of their own auditive decisions and choices by which they can create personal and meaningful representations of ideas. <clears throat>